Notice the title of my teaching today is But Tarry Ye. But Tarry Ye, or You. If I may put it in the modern vernacular, but wait, wait. What may we be waiting for? Well, let's turn to the gospel according to Luke. Chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of course, Matthew and John were disciples of Jesus. They were amongst the original 12. Luke or Mark was not. What do we know about Mark? What do you know about Mark, his background? In Galatians 4, 4, or Colossians 4.14, 4, Paul wrote, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Evidently, Luke was a disciple of Paul, and his profession, his background, was as a physician, as a doctor, a health care professional, if you will. Luke is from Antioch. Many believe Luke to be a Gentile, assuming that the book of Luke is the only book of the 66 that is written by a Gentile. Of course, a lot of this is based on tradition. I generally like to accept tradition unless they have good reason not to. So what does Luke have to say to us today? Let's go to the end of the book of Luke. Chapter 24. Oh, one other important point I want to make about Luke. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than anyone. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So he wrote about 27% of the New Testament. He wrote more than Paul, even more than John. So that's notable, but he wasn't one of the original 12. Luke uh, chapter 24, are you with me? Prayer time with Brother Jed. I believe this is lesson 32. I hope you've been learning things. I hope I've inspired you to further study and prayer We've been especially emphasizing the miraculous. And this week, I'm going to be in emphasizing Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, May 31st. Many of the churches, if not most of the churches, should be re reopened then. President Trump's original target date for reopening the churches was Easter. He missed that, unfortunately. But the day of Pentecost is a very significant day for believers to gather. And I'm promoting that just like a pastor can usually count on Easter being one of the days in which his church overs is most attended out of the year. So a lot of preparations made for Easter more than usual. So let's make Pentecostal Sunday next May 31st as people are going back to church after being away for two months. Let's make it a big day, a big day of celebration. All right, Luke chapter 24. Um, this is after Jesus' resurrection. He's making appearances to his disciples.
He says in verse 44, And these are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things might be fulfilled, which were written in the law and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So right, Paul said, this is the gospel that we preach, 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins and rose again according to the scriptures. According to the law of Moses, according to the prophets, according to Psalms, there's so many prophecies in there about Jesus. Then, verse 45, Jesus opened their understanding they might understand the scriptures. We need to have the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. It's one thing to know what the Bible says. It's another thing to understand what the Bible says. And the more we understand, the more effective and the more powerful we will be in the kingdom of God. God wants to enlighten your mind. Quicken your mind. We Christians ought to be the greatest intellectuals, not the secularists, not the unbelievers, not the skeptics. We should be the thinkers. It takes a lot of thinking to understand, a lot of study to understand. I want to have understanding. So that's why we're having these teachings, so you can have a better understanding of the scriptures as I prepare them. I get a better understanding as I study to prepare this and to feed it back to you, what God has been showing me. And he said unto them, Hello, Eric Roman, thank you for watching. And Jesus said unto them, Thus it is written. Thus it is written. Jesus uses that phrase often. It is written. And then he refers to the law of Moses, to the Psalms, or to the prophets. It is written. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Hallelujah and that the repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So there's our mission, folks. There was the mission of the disciples to preach the resurrection and the repentance and remission of sins. To have your sins remitted is to have your sins forgiven, to have your sins taken away. Not just to be delivered from the consequence of sin, but be delivered from the power of sin, the bondage of sin, the slavery of sin. And I preach repentance, always have from the beginning, a virtual beginning. I preached repentance. And that's often what's missing in gospel presentations today. It's just accept Christ, ask Jesus into your heart. Too often the message of repentance is not mentioned. To repent is to turn from a self-centered to a God-centered life. Now, some preach repentance without using the word, because I, I try to be more modern and relate to people today. Uh, repentance is such an old-fashioned word. But as for me, I like the old-fashioned words. I. I like the old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's hard to find today. I've been visiting churches uh, since really our church is not open yet. And we normally go to when I'm home in Indiana. So I've been visiting different churches. But it's not exactly... I appreciate what the churches are doing. They're doing a fine job, the ones I've visited, but it's not what I would call the old time religion. But I'm an old timer, so what do you expect? 
But even when I first got saved, I wanted the old time religion. It appealed to me. I've always liked that song, give me that old time religion. So even when I was a young Christian, a young minister, I still liked the old time religion. I could see it, I could see the changes coming and I didn't particularly care for that. So we preach repentance and remission of sins, and you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of what? Basically, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, yesterday I shared with you, I was saying to myself, well, here I'm preaching all this power and signs, miracles and wonders and great healings and how the church needs to have that sort of power today. And I was wondering, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm not doing greater works than Jesus did. Not even, I'm not even doing as much work as he did. Oh, my ministry certainly does have the miraculous in it like Jesus did. And I wonder, you know, people are going to say, well, physician, heal yourself. And uh, that is troubling. But what are we a witness of? We're a witness of a miracle. The miracle of a man named Jesus, rising from the dead. What greater miracle than there could there be than that? The whole Christian faith is rooted and grounded in the miraculous, a miracle. So much so that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ be not risen, our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. So without the miracle of the resurrection, my teaching to you today, today is vanity, it's useless. There's no meaning or purpose if Christ be not risen. I've been talking about faith, having great faith to do mighty works, to move mountains. That's all meaningless and irrelevant if Christ be not risen. So yes, I believe in miracles and I believe in miracles for today. We need to emphasize this. It was emphasized in the Bible. Peter describes Jesus' ministry, which has become basically a, a theme verse to prayer time with Brother Jed. Each of my 32 lessons, I think I've alluded to Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, Peter's description of Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. These were supernatural healings. He, he moved in the spiritual realm and so should we be. I think often we're not. And if we are moving in the spiritual realm, we haven't reached the heights that we ought to have and that is available for us now in this time. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye. Here's where well, I got my title for my message. But tarry ye. But wait. But wait. I'm sending the promise of the Father, but wait. In the city of Jerusalem. Until you be endued with power from on high. We need to tarry. We need to wait before we go until we get power from on high. We have a lot of people going with a little power. 
I better go with little power than when I go at all. But I want to go with great power. It was this great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I want to have great grace and great power. We have to tarry for that. We have to wait for that. Tarry in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, in the spiritual sense of the term, would be in your home until you, before you go out, you know, first you try to reach the people in your community and then you go out, you expand your ministry. It all starts in tearing and waiting and getting the power from on high, the power of the Holy Ghost. In Pentecostal churches, when I was young, they used to talk about tearing for the Holy Ghost. In Pentecostal churches, a big aspect of the service is the altar call. Now, this just isn't an altar call for salvation, although that is of utmost importance, the most important thing. We've got to be saved from sin. We've got to be saved before we can get the power. But come up and tarry and, and wait on the Holy Spirit to move in our midst. And oftentimes you have to wait a while. I've been to Pentecostal churches that the, the altar service may be longer than the praise and worship and the singing and the hymns and, and even the, and, and the sermon. Sometimes last a few hours or more even. We've got to wait on the Lord and we maybe don't have the power because we're not tearing, we're not waiting on the Lord to move in our midst. We want to get home. Want to go out to eat. We want a fellowship. But we need to get back to tarrying for the Holy Ghost. And Jesus, verse 50, led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, hallelujah, ascended into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, great joy. Hallelujah. Great joy. Do you have joy? I suppose you do but do you have great joy? We need great joy. Has there been great joy in America over the last two months? I think we're some. But you look at the news, everything's sad, people are dying and getting sick and this and that. And great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And this is another reason maybe we're not getting the power. They were continually in the temple. Praising and blessing God. We got to continue in the temple. You know, many have made the excuse during this time when our church has been closed, well, the, the building's not the church, and uh, we don't really need the church building anyway, and um, we can gather in our homes. That's what the early disciples did. Well, yes, they did that. But they also went to the temple. The temple. So we need both, gather in your home, yes, bring in your neighbors, have Bible studies, have prayer times. I'm all for that. But don't forget to gather continually in the temple. Doing what? Praising and blessing God. 
We want to be blessed. I think we'll get more power when we want to bless God as much as we want to be blessed. But the, uh, the emphasis has been on getting blessed instead of giving blessings to God and others. We have our priorities wrong. Until we get our priorities straight now, we're not going to see the power of God that we need. Thank you, Rosa. Yes, God bless you for teaching of the word. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I receive that blessing. So now we're going to get back into the temple, back into our houses of worship. Our churches. They're opening up again. May 31st, Pentecostal Sunday. I'm promoting that. I'm going to be promoting that all week. Let's make it a big day, bigger than Easter. Let's make sure we're all there, big crowd. Call your neighbors, call your friends, call your relatives. and Say, we need to all get back to church. Let's meet there next Sunday. Pastors, open up. Open the churches, the president said. Open the churches. Now, he was saying that of the governors, but I think there's an implication there. I think he was giving a message to the pastors as well. Pastor, open up your church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's open them up. I think we can do it legally now, you know, with the president's backing. Might be some still problems out in California, Maine, perhaps a few other states, but in most states it's not going to be a problem anymore. And even in California, I understand, uh, I've seen different figures of how many have signed a petition, a peti uh, petition that they're going to meet on Sunday, the 31st in California, it's over 1,000. I've seen up to 3,000 maybe signed. I don't know exactly what the number is that they're going to meet anyway. So maybe it's, you know, I know some of you have to wait on your denominational. Um, if you're in a denominational setting, they get, you know, the permission of the superintendent or the bishops or whatever. And I understand that. And, Maybe you can't open them up. We got to have respect for authority. So there is that factor. I don't want to judge you on this, but I want to encourage you to open up that church if you possibly can. And celebrate Pentecost. Hallelujah. Celebrate Pentecost in a mighty way. Acts. You know, Luke broke the Acts also. I believe I'll save my teaching on Acts the day of Pentecost until tomorrow. Get into that. What really happened on the day of Pentecost? I'll probably have to spend a couple of days on that. We need another Pentecost. That's what Jesus was saying in Luke, tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. get that power. That's what we've been studying now. We can get the power of God. It's through the Holy Ghost. The church has never been closed if we really had the power of God. Everybody says, I want to go to church. I want to get prayed for. I want to 
security against this virus. I have victory over it. You know, Trump, I was just watching him at a Memorial Day ceremony. He says, we're going to drive this virus back. Well, his weapons are basically carnal weapons, although he believes in God and Jesus Christ and man of prayer and pets. They've been praying. But we need that kind of faith. We're going to drive it back. The hidden enemy he calls it. And he's seeking even the aid of the military in doing that. We need, we, as pastors, as evangelists, someone like yourself, we need that same attitude that uh, the president is, is advocating. All right. Uh, hey, Stephen. Glad you're watching. Anybody have any prayer requests? Praise God. Probably a, we have such a nice day, nice Memorial Day out here. Probably not too many people, maybe online uh, right now to tune in. But I'm glad to have the three, and this is an important lesson, and we're going to be getting to the book of Acts here, Acts chapter 1. There's a book of action. And we want to go back to church, Pentecostal Sunday, because why? Because the church is where the action is. Although it's more than the church. It's there where we'll get endued with power to act and go out in the streets and highways and hedges and compel men to come in. So we want to do both. I do both. I go to church. I want to minister to the saints. But I also want to minister to the sinners out in the streets and highways and hedges. It doesn't have to be one or the other. We can do both. Father, hallelujah, help us to do both. Endure us with power from on high. Lord, help us to understand the scriptures. Lord, you concentrate in your teaching on not just quoting the Bible, quoting Moses and Psalms and the prophets, but you gave men understanding of the scriptures. You lived out the scriptures. You went about doing good and healing people and delivering people and setting people free. You had the power. We want the power of Pentecost, Lord. Oh, Lord, send the power on us, especially on Pentecostal Sunday, Lord. That'll be a look back as a turning point in Christian history where Christians got serious with God. Hallelujah. Very, very serious. Very, very serious with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's one of the things I was turning back to Luke 24 before I leave that I wanted to point out that I forgot to point out to you. Luke 24. Verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. So God's blessed us. So let's go out and bless others. Let's bless him. God blesses us. We bless him. And, and, and we bless others. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried into heaven. He ascended into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. With great joy. Hallelujah. Give us this great joy, God. And uh, we have a prayer request from Rosa. Pray for our churches in California 
that will be opening in California. Less, yes, Lord, bless them. Bless these pastors, Lord, for that are going to open up, stand against the governor. He's operating outside of jurisdiction. He doesn't have jurisdiction over the church. And the governor has jurisdictions where the pastors don't have, where the bishops don't have. Let's have respect for one another's jurisdictions. So bless them, Lord. Protect them as they're making the decision. Probably still getting opposition and calls. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You gotta wait. So Lord, we pray that these pastors will listen to God and you'll bless them as, as they reopen and, and people will want to gather and bless God and worship God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's it.